faço a abertura desse nosso encontro é, de hoje à, hoje à tarde. É um evento co-organizado pela Fundação Fernando Henrique Cardoso e pela Japan House, aqui representada pelo Carlos Augusto Rosa. É, é um prazer, Carlos, podemos organizar um tema importante. Eu, no momento em que introduzi a professora Tatsumi, falaria um pouco mais a esse respeito. Neste primeiro momento, vou me limitar a essas breves palavras de apresentação, passar o, o, a palavra ao Carlos, que dará início aos trabalhos. Carlos, a palavra é sua. Obrigado, Sérgio. Boa tarde, boa tarde, good afternoon. Uh, Yuki Tatsumi, é um prazer estar com vocês aqui nessa tarde um pouco abafada de São Paulo, ainda bem que a professora Tatsumi está curtindo melhores ares lá nos Estados Unidos, em Washington DC, da onde ela está, mas quem está aqui em São Paulo, deve... estamos todos sofrendo por, por as, pelas questões climáticas, mas vamos superar, superamos tantas coisas, vamos superar mais essa, né? Bom, pessoal, uh, me apresentando rapidamente, meu nome é Carlos Augusto Rosa, eu sou o vice-presidente executivo da Japan House São Paulo e é um prazer estar com todos vocês aqui. Falando rapidamente sobre a Japan House, nós somos um projeto que tem como principal objetivo mostrar o, o, o Japão atual aqui pela América Latina. A Japan House de São Paulo, apesar de estar baseada fisicamente aqui na Avenida Paulista, ela não se limita a nossa cidade apenas, ela tem como jurisdição, podemos dizer assim, atuar desde o do México até a, a, a Argentina, toda a América Latina, levando conhecimento, levando informações, enfim, mostrando um pouco esse país tão fascinante que está lá do outro lado do mundo, que é o Japão, que ao mesmo tempo é, é distante geograficamente da gente, mas tão próximo a todos aqui da América Latina, em especial ao, aos brasileiros, pelos 130 anos de tratado de amizade que existe entre os países, um pouco menos da imigração, mas desde 1908, quando veio o primeiro navio aqui para o Brasil, que o Japão é parte presente da nossa vida e a gente aprende e ensina também bastante nesse país, uh, ao mesmo tempo longe geograficamente, mas perto dos corações aqui dos brasileiros. A Japan House está localizada aqui na Vida Paulista, como eu comentei, nós abrimos as portas em 2017 e a nossa missão é mostrar o Japão e a gente faz isso através de várias editorias. A gente fala de arquitetura, fala de artes, fala de negócios, fala de gastronomia, fala de educação e procura mostrar várias facetas do Japão. Também através das exposições que temos aqui na Japan House. Então, desde já, eu convido a nossa audiência que possa se deslocar aqui na Vida Paulista. A Japan House tem atualmente duas exposições muito interessantes sobre moda uma no nosso andar terra e uma no nosso segundo andar, além de lojas, restaurantes, café, biblioteca, enfim, vários aspectos tentando trazer aqui para esse, esse espaço da nossa cidade um pouco do, do que seria visto hoje lá no Japão. São três Japan Houses, uma em São Paulo, uma em Londres, uma em Los Angeles. A, a de São Paulo, para a nossa alegria, foi a primeira a ser aberta em 2017. E desde que a gente abriu as nossas portas, nós já recebemos aí mais de 3 milhões e 500 mil visitantes na nossa sede. Uh, então, a gente recebe aí nos finais de semana alguma coisa como 4 e 5 mil pessoas. A entrada é 100% gratuita, então são todos muito bem-vindos para vir aqui e ver as nossas exposições, também participar dos nossos eventos, workshops, palestras, enfim, a gente procura em todas as nossas atividades mostrar um pouco do, do Japão. A Japan House também está bastante presente nas nossas mídias sociais, no nosso site, para aqueles que não podem se deslocar, então existem conteúdos atualizados quase que diariamente nas nossas redes e as nossas exposições podem ser acessadas de forma virtual também para aqueles que não conseguem se deslocar para cá poderem conhecer um pouco do Japão. Uh, como, como foi dito pelo Sérgio no início, é um prazer estar aqui trabalhando com vocês para mostrar o Japão e uma das facetas do Japão é justamente discutir essas questões que envolvem a, a posição do Japão no, no mundo e por isso que vamos hoje falar um pouco, ou ouvir um pouco sobre a posição do Japão no mundo cada vez mais incerto, uh, que é um tema que eu tenho certeza que vai interessar a todos nós. Bom, eu não vou me alongar, porque vocês não estão aqui para me ouvir, sim, eu ouvi a professora Yuki Tatsumi, que tem muito mais a agregar ao nosso webinar do que eu. Agradeço imensamente a presença de todos, reforço o convite a nos visitar aqui na Japan House, e estamos à disposição para aquilo que for necessário, ok? Obrigado, Sérgio, um bom evento para todos nós. It's a great pleasure to, to have you here with us, uh, Professor Tatsumi. 
Um, I will introduce you to, to our audience very briefly, and then I'll give you the, the floor. Professor Tatsumi is Senior Fellow, uh, Co-Director of the East Asia Program and Director of the Japan Program at the Timson Center. She has a, a master's degree from the prestigious Ponit School of Advanced Studies from John Hopkins University. She has uh, published extensively. I will limit myself just to mention the two uh, most recent publications uh, she authored. Uh, um, these are Balancing Between Nuclear Deterrence and Disarmament, Views from the Next Generation, Stimson Center, and Lost in Translation, U.S. Defense Innovation in Northeast Asia. Having said that, I think it's, uh, it's interesting to understand why we are organizing this, uh, this seminar, this event uh, today. It has to do with the, the mission of the Cardozo Foundation. And one of, uh, of the aspects of this mission is to shed light on on ge geopolitical geopolitical issues, with the ob objective of enhancing the understanding of geopolitical issues by key players in Brazil, ranging from the academia to to the business sector, of course, including government officials. Uh, I don't have uh, to say that Japan and and Brazil have strong historical ties. Uh, I don't know whether uh, Professor Tatsumi knows that, but Sao Paulo, as far as I know, is the largest Jap has the largest Japanese community outside uh, Japan and in the world. Japan has been a strong supporter of Brazilian uh, agricultural development. Uh, the famous Producer, a program financed by Japan that started in the 70s, and it was critical to the development of uh, agricultural in the savanna region in the center of uh, Brazil. And of course, as everybody knows, Japan is part and, and of the past and the present and certainly of the future of, of Brazilian industry. Um, Japan is, um, is a topic of interest here, not only because of the ties that the Brazil has with Japan, but because obviously Brazil, uh, Japan is one of the largest economies in the world, and, and Japan is one of the countries in the world most affected by U.S.-China growing strategic rivalry. Uh, so it's our pleasure uh, to invite Professor Tatsumi to address this uh, topic, uh, which is of great interest here in, in Brazil. And uh, I thank uh, the Japan House for co-hosting this uh, this event with the Cardozo Foundation today. And I would like to give the floor to Professor Tatsumi so that she can uh, share her knowledge and her views on the topic on the table this afternoon. Professor Tatu Tatsumi, the floor is yours. Obrigada, Sergio. And uh, boa. Uh, boa tarde, uh, senoras and senores. And first of all, congratulations. This is the seventh anniversary of the Japan House. And that was a, that was one of the great uh, embodiment of the strong people-to-people -people tie between Japan and Brazil has historically enjoyed, as you mentioned, Sergio. And uh, this is also a very important year in the uh, Brazilian-Japan Brazilian relationship. This year marks the 10th anniversary of uh, two countries declaring a global, strategic global partnership and under which uh, many uh, policy initiatives have been launched. Many of them focus on the uh, disaster resiliency assistance, um, renewable energy, biofuel, um, global, um, global partnership initiative. So I really, um, I really am uh, honored and delighted to speak at this uh, such an uh, important year for the Japan's relationship with Brazil. And the topic that you mentioned weighs very heavily on uh, Japanese people's mind, which is how does Japan chart its own future as United States and China continues to intensely compete for its global influences, 
who will set the uh, rule of the road in terms of the future of the international order, which will impact all of us. And what has been particularly concerning to Japan is that, uh, of course, Japan has been historically in the past was one of the biggest provider of the economic, economic assistance to China. And Japan celebrates China's uh, miraculous um, economic development. However, we were all hoped that uh, as China grows economically, China will accept more and more of the uh, existing international order that has benefited from the, um, all the countries and most of the countries around the world since the beginning of the United Nations. But especially in the last five to seven years, um, Chinese, uh, Japanese uh, government, as well as its people, has been recognizing some behaviors uh, coming out of uh, Beijing, uh, policy decisions made by Beijing, is not necessarily uh, conducive to the uh, peace and secure and stable international order from which all countries can benefit from. And in, on top of that, especially in the last two to three years, Japanese people and the government officials alike had witnessed with growing concern about China's relationship with the countries such as Russia, North Korea, and other disruptive countries that challenges the peace and stability across the globe is being strengthened. And that really derived um, most recent Japan's uh, gov Japanese government's revision of the national security strategy that, came, that was announced in December 2022. Up until that point, Japan had con discussed its concern about Chinese behaviors in the world stage or certain parts of the world, including Japan's own neighborhood. But Japan's uh, description of China has always been that China is uh, one of the most important countries that Japan needs to have constructive bilateral relationship. However, when and under the uh, most recent national security strategy, Japan identified China as the greatest, gravest security concern that Japan sees in the foreseeable future. So what caused this shift? Uh, two things. One, first and foremost, is as I briefly described, and I will be happy to talk a little bit more about this once we get to a question and answer session, is the very concerning behavior by Chinese military, Chinese Coast Guard, and Chinese fishermen and Chinese government maritime oceanic research, research ships around the waters near Japan and also beyond. Uh, we have been reading more and more about uh, Chinese vessels harassing Vietnamese or Filipinos, uh, Coast Guard ships or its own fishermen over the uh, disagreement of the uh, sovereignty issues in that part of the world. It is okay to have a disagreement on many issues but one thing that cannot be tolerated is to do something about it by force, which Japan has been witnessing that uh, China has been doing more and more in recent years. So that's one uh, reason why Japan became very concerned about this latest trend. And the other one is the parallel trend that Japan has been witnessing happening in the United States, oddly enough, um, from the place that uh, I'm speaking from. Over the years, as China grew and its uh, national strength became more large, became uh, stronger, and its policy looks more externally and going outward, parallel to that is that the, there is a more uh, perceptions within Japan about United States turning inward. And there are growing questions about United States staying power as the uh, one of the lead, one of the leading nations to uphold the existing international order 
rules, and norms that everyone has been benefited from. And their concern got very serious during the uh, when the uh, Don, Mr. Mr. Donald Trump became the American president um, eight years, seven years ago. There, J- Japanese public saw what um, what it means for the um, what the America First policy looks like. It's very bilateral. It doesn't. It's very transactional. It doesn't have. It doesn't place a lot of value in the in the importance of the alliances and partnership that United States actually led the global international effort to build since 1945. So this is a very concerning trend, and uh, it is just a interesting coincidence that uh, we are um, we are about to have the first and maybe the last uh, American presidential debates between the two candidates tonight. So I'm sure my friends in Japan, uh, media and outside, will be watching the debate or get the uh, caption of the debate very nervously as the as the night goes on, and it will be uh, it will be a morning for them. So I'm not quite sure uh, how um, how all these government offices uh, make sure that their uh, officials uh, stay engaged with their work while they're a little bit distracted about what uh, what kind of a debate is happening. So those are the two trends that uh, Japan has considered very, very concerning. And I, I list goes on. Um, what was very important for Japanese uh, public to see was Russian invasion of Ukraine in 2022. There, they they saw exactly how it happens if country lose uh, if country um, decides to do, settle the international disagreements by force and by military force and the conflict goes on to today it's at the stalemate but that's when uh, that's when um, Japanese public really came to realize that it it really needs to begin to invest in its own defense capability it really needs to re uh, re-energize its own effort about deepening relationships and partnership with the allies, security partners, and friends around the world, including Brazil. And uh, that is exactly the effort that the Prime Minister Akshida has been leading since he came into the office about about roughly about three years ago. He really um, implemented the vision that was laid out 12 years ago now, by a late former Prime Minister Abe, as a Japan, as one of the one of the leading player in international community, who stands up to defend the norms and rules and international international order that at most vast majority of the international community have benefited. So for the for Japan, though, it is the picture is not exactly quite simple because at the end of the day as much as Japan is concerned about China China is Japan's neighbor so you have this big neighbor even though there is a big water in between them so it does really have to have a stable relationship and as the competition between United States and China becomes more intense it becomes it make, makes it very increasingly more difficult for Japan to navigate between that of the shifting dyna, constantly shifting dynamics in the U.S. China relations. And what Japan um, is one of the one of the top concern about uh, U.S. China relations that the Japan has at the moment is has something that could also impact uh, Brazil and the rest of the world is what happens with the uh, economic order in the in the world. US since uh President uh, Trump's tenure, but President Biden kind of uh maintained that same line that uh US is uh carefully trying to separate its own um economic supply chain, economic production line, economic uh, business base, global business base away from China. And ex- and expects allies and partners follow the suit. But none of uh, none of our economy, including Japan's, including Brazil's, are big enough to simply simply take that turn. 
Japan's economy is very remains to be very interdependent with that of China. China is a global exporter, and Japanese and Brazilian businesses will all ha both have a both have a stake in um, how Chinese economy does, and because it really heavily impacts of our own economy. So those are the, some of the complicated issues that um, Japan has been grappling with. But if for those of you, especially for those of you who are interested in Japan House, you are probably watching the news that after a three very successful foreign policy accomplishments, Prime Minister Kishida is about to step down at the end of the month. So his uh, last international stage speech will likely be United Nations General Assembly um, speech that will probably come up in the two weeks. But what that does leave the question that uh, what happens when Prime Minister Kishida steps down and his successor takes over? Is there more continu con continuity of his policy or that we can see some big change in his policy direction? For what I could see and for all the candidates, uh, leading candidates for, as uh, his successor are saying um, over the years, um, that there's one piece of good news that will be, we will likely see more continuity than change. But at the same time, as successful as Prime Minister Kishida have been in the areas of foreign and security policy, he still had a lot of uh, domestic challenges that he left unaddressed. Partly a problem was partly structural. Part uh, problem was that he was really focusing on pulling the Japanese economy out of the uh, um, coronavirus uh, era, uh, a country shutdown, and get the economy back on track. So some of the long-term challenges that Japan will have to address to stay vibrant, vibrant economy, and stay a robust player in the international stage, really still left unaddressed. One of them is uh, democ uh, demography. As some of you know, Japan is one of the fastest aging country in terms of its population. Within a 15 to 20 years of time, over 30% of its residents will be considered senior citizens. So how does economy stay vibrant when you really have a um, youth generation um, labor shortage? How does Japan navigate through that? How does Japan's government finance sustain the current uh, very well-funded uh, pension system and universal health care system that all the public has been enjoying over the long term? So those are just some of the issues that Japan will have to grapple with sooner than later. The more, um, the further they postpone the address to address that issue, those issues. Uh, the more serious, it only gets more serious. So that is one of the big, uh, that, that are the couple of the uh, big issues that awaits uh, Prime Minister Kishida's successor and his successors, successors, successors for some generation, uh, for uh, decades to come. But why don't I stop here and then I will look forward to uh, our conversation and the, uh, getting the, uh, getting the uh, question uh, from the audience. All right, all right, Professor Tatsumi, thank you so much for, for your presentation. I would like to suggest that we first delve into uh, the, the question of to what extent uh, Japan has already been affected by the growing rivalry between the, the, the U.S. and China. And then the second part of our conversation could address the issues of uh, Japan's alliances with other countries, uh, especially in the region, Vietnam, uh, mm -hmm. Philippines, with the backing of the U.S., presumably. But the first part of our conversation would be about um, how Japan has already been affected by the, the growing rivalry. Economically, for instance, to start with, uh, uh, with the economy, um has the the Japanese economy been affected by this decoupling, partial decoupling of the US and, and China economies, or or this is not the case? Um I believe uh Japan I think uh impact is not fully felt yet. That's a great question, but I think it will uh it will be felt 
um, over the long um, over the long term, no doubt. Why? Because um, there are some government regulations and restrictions that are coming out of Washington that could restrain that could um, restrict Japanese companies' um, access to the U.S. market, participation in some of the um, some of the projects that are that the U.S. government undertakes, for example. Or um, I think one uh, example that I could think of is in the area of a def defense equipment transfer. One of the uh, priority that was that has been set by the uh, National Defense Strategy, also announced, also revised and modernized in December 2012, uh, 2012 is the uh, revitalization of Japan's own defense industry. Because of a decades-long restriction about uh, not being able to transfer any kind of defense equipment or technology to countries uh, um, countries other than the United States under a very limited circumstances, uh, Japanese domestic defense industry has been significantly weakening over the last dec over the last several decades. Now that the trans now that the restrictions have been significantly relaxed, and Japanese defense industry have been encouraged to um, seek more opportunities to collaborate with uh, American partners, British partners, Italian partners on the develop research and development and production of some of the major defense equipment. However, Japan's defense industry is very unique in a way that uh, unlike um, typical US defense industry that you know of the name, Boeing Company, Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman Corporation, um, RTX, formerly known as Raytheon Company. All those American defense industry com industries, the predominant share of their business has been dealt with either Department of Defense or other parts of the U.S. government. Contrary to that, uh, Japan's defense industry is a very, very small portion of a big manufacturing company that, um, and that their bulk majority of the company is in the uh, commercial business. And because of that, big majority of big uh, percentage of those comp that big uh, total overall company has a lot of a uh, lot of business interest and transactions with either China mm -hmm. or, you know, China-based companies. So if, um, for example, if United States um, begin to put restrictions on those companies that has any business dealings with China, Chinese companies or China-based companies that could have a tie with China, that really limits Japan's uh, defense industry's ability to collaborate with its American partners. So that is one um, example that, that I can immediately think of, of how we could impact um, Japan economically and in industrial life. Very, very interesting. Uh, well, do you see in this respect, do you see any significant difference between the Kamala's presidency and the Trump's presidency? In your presentation, you, you have mentioned uh, President Trump uh, policy in not in a very favorable way, but still, I think uh, this is a fair question because you have Absolutely. also said that Biden's maintained uh, most of the restrictions that were set by President uh, Trump and added uh, new ones uh, to mm -hmm. <clears throat> to the menu. So right, like a chip sack. And... So. That is one interesting question, and I'll actually be curious what each candidate may say tonight. But already, I think uh, signs are not very good for um, should the uh, should the uh, Kamala Harris um, be elected to the president because she already issued a statement formally objecting the uh, sale of a U.S. steel to Nippon Steel. However. On the U.S., you know, immediately after that statement, U.S. Steel actually issued a very different statement, saying, despite those statements, we still feel that it's in our our meaning, you know, U.S. Steel's best interest 
to invite investment from Nippon Steel mm -hmm. to sustain the vital vitality of our company and sustain um, keep this um, keep the steel industry job in the United States. And uh, President Trump really hasn't spoken too strongly on this since the election began. Um, his whole thing is America first. You know, job needs to be generated in 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 the United States first before American companies starts worried about investing abroad. So you could very well make an argument that um, in a strange way, um, new Trump second Trump administration may have a little bit little bit more of a flexibility when it comes to issues like this, if, if Japan, or I think this, apply, this applies to any other allies and partners of the United States, if they can make a very convincing case to President Trump himself at the leader's level, or people who are very close to Trump, President, um, former President Trump, about the economic benefit that their, you know, their agreement or the, their negotiation what they're trying to negotiate could mean for American economy. He may, in a strange way, have a little bit more flexibility. So it's still really, um, jury is still out, is I think the common English phrase that we use. But that is definitely one of the things that I would listen to carefully for um, in uh, this evening's debate, starting in about five way. hours. All right, we will be all watching and mesmerized by the debate. Let me piggyback on the, on the question, one of the questions asked by, by um, Mr. Nakamura to sort of enlarge uh, the, the very same question about uh, the, the president, U.S. presidential elections. Uh, and his question, Mr. Nakamura, is... Uh, what kind of benefits uh, the U.S. presidential elections can bring to uh, to to Japan? You you've just shed light on the that kind of gray zone uh, about uh, economy and and military equipment and that kind of thing. Let me mention uh, the fact that you've you've said that at your presentation that you are concerned about a rule based world order right if we take this yardstick to to measure the two candidates do you see any difference between kamala and trump and which one do you think would be more beneficial to to japan so if we stick if we only take out the uh, this uh, international order global rules and norms and uh, respect for the existing multilateralism, uh, I would have to say that uh, Vice President Harris comes way ahead of uh, Mr. Trump, because as I said, uh, as I briefly touched upon in my opening remarks, um, Japan saw U.S. becoming very transactional, having not showing a whole lot of faith or confidence in the alliance relationship, or any value, you know, much value in the alliance relationship um, during the uh, while the uh, Mr. Trump was a president uh, seven years ago. And uh, on that note, um, you could probably they feel I think they feel like they can count more on uh, Kamala Harris administration in terms of upholding the existing norms. You know, fight for the leading the fight. You know, leading the effort to, uh, um, I guess, maintain the uh, health of the uh, existing rules and norms. So I think on that one, I think uh, uh, potential Kamala Harris administration will be someone that uh, Japan will be much more comfortable with. So, but they have the other aspect of the, its impact on economic policy or trade policy or export control policy that you may Japan may start seeing with too, with not much of a flexibility. On the other hand, so this is why I think uh, I would say Japan is not an exception. I think all the countries all around the world who have some kind of partnership relationship with the United Sounds States familiar. are yeah. very familiar, right? Yeah. So I think uh, Japan's a concern yeah. is very much shared, I think. 
<laughs> around the world. Yeah, no, you're definitely right. Um, do you do you see? Uh, do you think there is a sort of a, a strategic consensus uh, among Japanese foreign policy community and politicians about uh, the view you were expressing here? Or this is a matter. It's it's a matter of controversy within within Japan. I think uh, if you asked me that question seven years ago, even five years ago, I would have said, yeah, there are still significant, you know, dissent. That there are still significant um, voice within Japan that emphasize more on cooperation with China, as opposed to viewing China with concern. But I think this past past five year really um, turned or impacted the uh, Japanese, whether that's public or po politician or government officials, view toward that. Um, I think I think overwhelming majority of um, of people in Japan uh, looks at China with a concern. And it is not only because of its own behavior that it's been seeing. It is also about its relationship, strengthening of its relationship with countries like Russia, countries like China. Um, you know, Iran now seems to be com maybe coming coming into that picture too. It is it is all that connectivity that uh, Japan is now witnessing about not just about Chinese China's own behavior, but this a relationship that China seems to be building um, with with those countries that Japan also have a serious concerns with. That leads me to another question from the public, in this case from Regina Saboya, who asks uh, whether North Korea is a security challenge for Japan uh, or not. Can you add North Absolutely. Korea to, to that oh, yeah. picture? Oh, yeah. And um, make Very some much comments so. on it. Yeah. So North Korea actually has been the longest standing um, urgent threat that Japan has been facing. And what's shifted very much in the last 20 years or so is that if you talk to Japanese policymakers, you know, foreign policy officials, defense, defense officials, they talked about North Korea as a more immediate concern because of the ballistic missile um, threat that it poses against Japan, its clandestine nuclear program that it has, um, and its potential impact to Japan. But, you know, potential impact not to Japan, but its ability, ability to proliferate that technology elsewhere around the world, including non-government actors. Um, so you would have heard uh, Japanese officials talking about North Korea with the much more um, immediate sense of concern. And they do acknowledge that China could be a challenge, but it's very much long term. You know, that was probably 10 years ago. I think uh, since last five years or so, increasingly, they both became an immediate concern for Japan. And that's what makes it more challenging. And that's what makes uh, Japan's uh, ability to navigate this uh, tension between U.S. and China even more challenging. Can we contemplate the nightmare scenario? And the nightmare scenario is Chinese invasion of, of Taiwan. Oh, geez. <laughs> uh, right? the, the U.S. and Japan yes. have long, uh, has a deep-seated treaty of mutual security and, 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 and mutual cooperation and, and security. Japan is geographically located in a very hot spot. Is is there a national conversation, open national conversation, relatively open among the elite at least? Right. Yeah. Really. About, about this scenario and what would uh, Japan do in this case? So in this case, that's um, that also used to happen very very um, quietly. But I think increasingly, and that is probably driven by um, behavior that uh, they're witnessing from Beijing. For example, when a former uh, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi visited Taiwan, um, China immediately, uh, immediately after she left, you know, China immediately 
um, conducted a large scale um, joint military exercise really surrounding the island of Taiwan as if they're practicing to invade. Right. You know, so behavior like that really heightened their, that really made it easier for Japanese officials to talk a little bit more openly about what Japan may have to do, how we could impact Japan. And as you pointed out, um, Japan and Taiwan has enjoyed a very long um long history of uh, people-to-people relationship, um, economic relationship, cultural relationship. You know, Japanese people love to go to Taiwan. Um, before This is before all the Korean drama and K-pop start hitting the market. But uh, there's, there's all, you know, Taiwan always has a strong uh, fan in Japan. And then I think it's vice versa. So, and then also, you know, there are, there are many Japanese residents in Taiwan. So if something of that nightmare scenario that you mentioned happened from Japanese standpoint, um, they really don't have choice but to assist U.S. effort to help Taiwan defend itself. But then if should that night, nightmare scenario comes to play, it really does impact Japan heavy, not to mention um, economic uh, disruption that it could cause. But then also it will definitely, no doubt, expose Japan to intervention, um, non-kinetic, I would say, you know, cyber disinformation um, intervention coming, you know, originating from Beijing. But then increasingly more and more people to start talking about this double layer, triple layer, triple triple layer nightmare scenario. So what if when everybody's are so occupied on what's happening across the Taiwan Strait, what happens when Russia decided to, you know, take you know, basically land on all the four disputed island between Japan and Russia? Or if Russia tries to, you know, distract the United States by doing something in Europe? So those are some of the things that uh, it's it's been considerably more openly spoken, you know, discussed among the, uh, at least among the elites now. Well, we've been talking about the adversaries. Let's talk, let's talk a little bit about the allies. Or, um, and um, um, how, what's your view about the, the, at present of the relationship between Japan, South Korea? Um, everybody knows about um, historical grudges, problems that Japan and South Korea uh entertain so to speak um in have both countries are both countries over it uh how close they are do they see things uh eye to eye um uh, in this strategic game being played in in the region and let's include in this conversation other countries like vietnam and, and philippines your take on that I think um, Japan's uh, relationship with Vietnam and Philippines, um, first of all, at, at this time of, you know, as of today, all those relationships are positive, especially Japan's relationship with the uh, Republic of Korea. South Korea has seen a considerable improvement, but then that is, you know, because of the uh, current uh, Korean president, President Yoon, um, took it into his own initiative to improve uh, uh, Korea's relations with Japan. But as we all know, he is ending the, you know, he's not exactly enjoying a po you know, high popularity rating in, in back home. His president, you know, his own presidential election is coming, coming, you know, not too, not too long, you know, not, not too long away. So there is a concern about what his predecessor might or might not decide to do in terms of what you know, how much of a continuity Japan can expect from a Korean government and its and its uh, attitude and a policy toward Japan, or is that going to be more you know change that we we're we're going to see? So those are those are all the questions that I have not yet openly discussed about, but definitely on um, leaders and uh, officials' mind. Um, but as far as today goes, though, um, two countries' relationship have really come a long way in terms of not just being functional, but really went go beyond um, 
basically, you know, overcoming, uh, mutually trying to overcome that history um, legacy that uh, you just referred to. With Vietnamese and Philippines, um, it has remained, you know, remained steadily positive, but especially with the uh, increasing pressure that Vietnam and the Philippines both feeling in their own, you know, own waters or right outside their EEZs uh, from uh, behavior from, a, you know, various Chinese vessels and the assistance that Japan has been providing to those countries to help them cope with those um, challenges. I think their uh, relationship has been very, um, ha has really um, be become uh, closer. And as for Philippines, especially, um, two governments agreed on the uh, reciprocal access agreement, which allows uh, Japan's Coast Guard ship or Japan's uh, self-defense force vessels to, you know, um, have an access to Filipino, um, Filipino like facilities. And that will facilitate um, more capacity building efforts um, and more effort to uh, share, you know, share information about the regional circumstances and so forth. So I think uh, those relationships have, have really also come very far. And if I may, uh, well, let me just also add one more country that we really haven't, two countries that we really haven't talked about Please. in that in that neighborhood. Um, one is India. Um, we all heard about the, you know, we all, we all have heard the term quad, um, U.S., Japan, Australia, and India. Um, those are the really um, four countries that originate, you know, originally formed a core group uh, when the, uh, way back when, I think it was 2004, when Indonesia suffered from a massive um, tsunami. And uh, it was for the uh, after disaster relief, you know, relief and assistance that four countries really formed the core group of uh, um, extending Indonesia um, assistance on that one. But then since then, um, this uh, Quad Corporation kind of came and went and ebbed and flowed. But as the uh, India's perception of uh, China's challenge have come closer and more in line, more aligned with uh, that of uh, Americans, Japanese, and Australians, I think this grouping began to have a new mean, you know, new life to it. Right now, it's a little bit strange situation because India has a unique position when it comes to its uh, view on the uh, Russian invasion, you know, Russia-Ukraine conflict, you know, Russia-Ukraine war. But when it comes to Indo-Pacific developments, I think four countries are very much on the same page. And Australia is really the uh, country that are closest to Japan um, of becoming a, um, being a treaty ally next to the United States. It has all the institutional arrangements in place. Um, trilateral uh, cooperation happens quite frequently in many different areas. So those are also, those are additionally two countries that Japan has actually um, continued to build and deepen its relationship, uh, regardless of who is the prime minister at the time in Japan. Thank you. Thank you for your uh, thorough answer to 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 my to my question um <laughs> let me insist a little bit more on the question of alliances uh, president biden has been praised by analysts such as thomas friedman for his efforts um in strengthening uh alliances with american friends and in in the region including all those countries you've just mentioned. Do, do you think uh, how dependent on the U.S. this alliance is, uh, or this alliance is, or, or whether it has acquired a dynamic of its own that can sort of move forward irrespective of who is in the White House? So I think that is one of the... Uh byproduct that came about, you know, what we call minilateral exercise, you know, minilateral relationship, not bilateral, but not so many that not, you know, you can't call it too small to call multilateral. Um, 
it is almost for Japan and in so many ways with the other U.S. allies and, you know, allies and partners, it's almost an insurance policy to stay. You make sure that the uh, U.S. Engage, continues to engage in the region and in their own, you know, in their own neighborhood. Um, it really started off as kind of U.S. leading the pack. But then as I think the time it, it went on, that relationship has really evolved into it's more of an effort for those allies and partners to ensure um, America's uh, sustained uh, engagement in the region. So I think it kind of works both ways. And it really started when, um, if you all remember, seven years ago, one of the first multilateral um, agreement that uh, newly ex newly inaugurated President Trump decided to withdraw was the uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership. And what did Japan do? Turned around and gathered everybody else and concluded that negotiation. And now we have CPTPP. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that really started the trend of, okay, we need this multilateral agreement with or without the United States. Because um, if, you know, if, if for nothing else, China is too big, too big of a challenge to take on for any of those one, you know, any of those countries alone. So they really do need each other with or without United States to cooperate, collaborate and um, build that network out. Final question on, on geopolitics, and then we're approaching the end of, of our session. I would like to consult you whether you would feel uh, at ease with uh, questions that touch on economic issues, or would you A little like... bit. I mean, on the overall, like, you know, general trend issues, yes. But don't, yeah, but give, the, don't ask questions... me about the numbers. The, so no, no your questions about um, the change in Japanese interest mm -hmm. rates and how that might Oh, gosh. Yes, uh, you're um, not. I mean, you're not supposed to answer uh, those questions because everybody knows here should should know that you're an expert on geopolitical issues and not on the. Oh, I have a personal a experience. Bit, uh, go I ahead. have a personal. I have. I'm. I have been personally impacted, um, <laughs> not just not just from a in, you know interest rate keeping so kept so low in Japan, <laughs> but. Um, um, thanks to the super weak yen, my yen saving account in Tokyo continues to continues to go down into value. So it is very important to me that the <laughs> Japanese economy picks up. So I, I I I hope you have been saving also in dollars. <laughs> yes, I have. Okay, okay. Wise 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 decision. Wise decision. Yes. But um, uh, take a step back. Yes. Final question on geopolitics and me, the final question altogether. Okay. Uh, wh what is your, I would say your gut feeling in, mm -hmm. in, in, about where uh, China is heading to? I mean, this hawkish warrior diplomacy and hawkish, sometimes disruptive um, posture in the region, especially. Uh, do you do you see them going all the way all the way down, or you 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 think they might sort of um, take a more middle of middle of the mm -hmm. <laughs> middle of the road approach? My gut feeling is it gets worse before it starts getting better. <laughs> Explain and, that. Uh, to me. So we're still in the trajectory, in the process, and I don't know how long this process will be, but I, I have my sense is that we're still on the process of things getting worse. But when I think about inflection point, that's when I, that's when my imagination can't, you know, doesn't reach my limit. What does that inflection point look like? Um, everybody talks about uh, Chinese uh, population going through you know going over the population cliff yeah how does that impact china internally and that in turn um impacts um government's external behavior because traditionally uh we have seen a pattern that uh china's external policy gets more aggressive 
um, and competitive as it faces more and more internal problems because it needs its public's outlet of that frustration. But how far does it go? How far is it enough? And at, at any point, will it reach a point where it can no longer, you know, contain people's frustration and the, you know, Chinese people's frustration turn against its own government? But then what happened? You know, it's a huge country. Um, it has so many dialects just within the country, not to mention the minorities and who's, you know, who's uh, living closer to the Western border. What does that look like? And if China implodes in that way, how does that impact uh, not just Japan, but global economy and global everything? So that's where my imagination kind of freezes up because that is, to me, that is a really real nightmare scenario for everybody, yeah. not just for Japan, yeah. but for everybody. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I think I feel tempted to stop here, but in, I think in honor of our audience, let me add one last absolutely. question, which yep. is... We still have three minutes. Or maybe two. <laughs> maybe three minutes. It, I can do it, this. It covers it covers around climate change. Yes. And uh, the opportunities that Japan see in Brazil and uh, possibilities of cooperation but, and this sort of thing. The question asked by A.C. Ferreira. Uh, if it's too specific for your taste, uh, uh, please shed light on, on climate change in Japan's policy agenda, both domestically and internationally, and then and then we close. So domestically, not just clim um, climate change, but it dates um, several decades for Japan. It really started from how Japan can combat um, industrial pollution as its economic as its economy developed. You know, clean air, clean water. That was a real issue back in 1960s and 1970s. Um, and environmental concern was real. That impacted people's lives. And uh, Japan, for the longest time, has been very detailed um, recycle, you know, recycling policy everywhere you go. For those of you, if you had ever visited Japan or even lived in Japan, Every, you know, every municipality has its own policy about what can be going to recycle bin of what type and, you know, certain type of recycle, you know, recyclables can only be collected at certain days. No, those, uh, you know, beverage pet bottles, like a label needs to come off because that's a different recyclable. So Japan has a long history. I would history. go nuts. It's very hard to remember. <laughs> um, Sometimes they actually specify what types of garbage bag you can use too. <laughs> True story. But um, so this this goes to show you Japan has taken um, em environment quite seriously long before we keep we started talking about climate change. So it is very consistent in you know when in Japanese policy both externally and domestic. Just and then also Japan. Let's not let's not forget Japan is a very um, energy resource poor country. So energy conservation has always been important to Japan. And in this case, it just so happened that uh, when once they start, you you start moving beyond carbon, um, carbon you know carbon economy, it really does lead to not just clean air and clean water, but it really does um, have a positive impact on the environment. So the environmental economy is really the um, environmental issue, climate change issue, is really an extension of what Japan had to combat domestically. And they're now just trying to demonstrate that it can be done as, you know, a country can be, you know, energy conscious, climate change conscious as it grows economically. So that is quite consistent. In the uh, in the uh, Japan's uh, Japan's policy in this realm, Professor Tatsumi, thank you, thank you so much for this wonderful conversation, and I mean it, I mean it. I really liked your 
your presentation, your answers, the the way you you honestly addressed the topics uh, I raised here. Carlos, would you like to add something uh, at the end of this session? I just would like to thank you very much for Professor Yuki Tatsumi. It was great to hear what you mentioned. We know that we are living strange times nowadays. But it's good to know that we have some hope for the future. And thank you very much for your clarity and, and the very, a very good way you explained to us the situation. Thank you very much. Thank All you right. very much for having me. Obrigada. Now, great pleasure. So it now, pleasure. in a, in a matter of in a matter of three hours, we're going to turn on our TV sets. Yes. And watch the debate. We mm. all will watch. I think so. <laughs> Most of us. Yes. All right. All right. Take care. For Thank sure. you so much. Take care. Thank Alice. you. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Thank you Thank all. You. Bye bye. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Bye. Thank you.